Okay, I think I'll get started uh, with the introductions and um, let's get going. So, um, welcome everybody. Good evening and welcome to the second BU Student Faculty Forum of this year, our fourth year in, in existence. Let me welcome those of you who have attended before and those of you who are joining us for the first time. I'm Virginia Sapiro, Professor of Political Science and Dean Emerita of the College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. When I'm not teaching courses on elections or gender and politics or political psychology, I am spending as much time as I can growing vegetables and flowers and baking. The BU Student Faculty Forums are sponsored by the Howard Thurman Center for Common Ground and the Dean of Students Office. Uh, they are designed to bring the BU community together to discuss important current issues of all sorts. It was founded on the premises that we have a lot to talk about together and that one important contribution faculty and staff can make to your informed and independent thinking and action about the critical issues of our day is to share with you some of what we have learned from our professional expertise and research. Last month, we focused on the election, which is still going on. For the rest of the year, however, we're going to be doing something we haven't done before. I've picked a central theme to frame all of our discussions. 2020 has been so hard for all of us in so many ways. I imagine at some point, all of us have found it hard to go on. So with that in mind, I've picked the theme of regeneration and healing. What do I mean by this? By regeneration and healing, I mean bringing health, recovery, growth, new life where there was damage, disease, hurt, or destruction. How do we bring justice to where there was injustice, compassion to where there was only self-interest? How do we repair the world? We'll carry that idea metaphorically through discussions of a wide range of different topics this year. For example, racism, disease, and environmental destruction. Tonight, we are beginning this series with a focus that has preoccupied so many of us for much of this year, regeneration from racism and ethnocentrism. As many of you know, each forum has two parts. First, our panel of faculty and staff with great professional knowledge about the topic will offer brief presentations based on their expertise. These will each last for less than seven minutes. I know that because using Zoom, I have the power to cut off their microphones. We always have faculty and staff from many different fields as we do tonight. So we have a great diversity of interests to approach the question at hand. Then we should have about 45 minutes for you to join with us in some good discussion on the topic and to participate. I hope many of you will do. When you want to participate, please submit your questions through the, uh, the Q&A function in Zoom. And you can do that at any time. When it's time for discussion, uh, Pedro Falci, who's online, he's the one who looks like balloons, will select from the questions you have submitted. And as always, we will finish at eight o'clock on the dot. So let me now move to the introduction of our panelists, and then I'll be quiet for a while until it's my turn to speak. I'm very excited to introduce them. First, we will have Tim Longman, who's a professor of political science and international relations. He's the acting director of the African Studies Center and director of the Institute on Culture, Religion, and World Affairs. He spent his career studying human rights, transitional justice, democratization, civil society, and the politics of race and ethnicity, as well as religion and politics. Much of his work has focused on Rwanda, where he has done extensive field research since 1992, and he's been involved with questions of justice since the horrific genocide of 1994 in that country. Catherine Kennedy, a native Bostonian, is the director of BU's Howard Thurman Center for Common Ground. She's in her 30th year at BU and had spent the first eight years in the Office of Development and Alumni Relations as a major gift fundraiser. Her major fundraising projects were the Questrom School of Business and the restoration of Marsh Plaza. 
Before she came to BU, her career included being a newspaper journalist and member of the Boston Globe's 1975 Pulitzer Prize winning team that covered the Boston school desegregation crisis. She was the only reporter that rode the buses with the children when they were stoned by the people outside. Director of a fellowship program that trained minority news reporters at the University of California at Berkeley. She was director of player relations for the original owners of the New England Patriots. She worked to establish a national degree completion program for athletes that all professional sports endorsed and participated in. And she was director of political fundraising for a US congressional candidate in Tennessee and a gubernatorial candidate in Massachusetts. And as director of the Thurman Center, she's my boss. Harvey Young is Dean of the College of Fine Arts, Professor of English and Professor of Theater. A cultural historian, his research centers on the performance and experience of race. As a commentator on popular culture, he's appeared on CNN 2020 and Good Morning America, as well as within the pages of the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Boston Globe and Vanity Fair. He came to us in 2018 from Northwestern University, where he was professor and chair of theater and had appointments in African American studies, performance studies, and radio, television, film, and where Wikipedia tells me, I'm sorry I found this, he taught one Meghan Markle. So with those introductions, um, See, I did read Google. With those introductions, I am going to turn it over to you and you'll go in order. Tim. Hi, thank you, Gina. And <clears throat> congratulations on teaching your last class today. Uh, as, as, a former, as a former student of Gina's many years ago, uh, I, I can say what a fantastic teacher you, you are. I was uh, six at the time. Yeah, exactly, me too. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I want to draw on my experience in, in two countries outside of the United States, um, where I've seen uh, attempts to try to, to um, rebuild, regenerate after um, violence based on race. Um, most of my work has been in Africa. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Rwanda. I've also spent a lot of time in South Africa. Those, those are the two cases that I want to um, draw on the, the most ex extensively. Um, and the reason I do that is because I think it can be very helpful to think about race relations and recovery in comparative perspective. I think there's a tendency to view the United States uh, as an exceptional case that is completely unlike any other. Um, and in fact, um, I have to say that, that I came to understand race relations in the United States much better after spending time outside of our country. Um, I imagined the first time I went to, to Africa, I sort of thought I might know what it's like to be black in the United States where you're often one of the very few people in a crowd. Um, and it was actually my experience in Africa that taught me what it was like to be white um, because I really experienced white privilege in that context in a way that made me much more conscious when I came back to the United States of the advantages that I have because of my race. Um, I was in Rwanda in the period just leading up to the genocide in 1994. Uh, I arrived there in 1992 and I left about 11 months before the genocide of the Tutsi there. Um, and I watched uh, the country fall apart. Um, I watched the country move from a very optimistic point where people thought that there was going to be a, uh, a, a democratic transition um, <clears throat> to increasing ethnic division and political division, growing violence. And by the time I left, I was very pessimistic about what would happen in the country. Um, I was not shocked when genocide took place. Um, I wouldn't have expected that it would have been uh, just ethnic. I expected there might be more political violence, but um, what I thought would happen in Rwanda um, uh, did, unfortunately. Uh, the world sat by and watched. Um, I, I then finished my PhD and I went back to Rwanda in 1995 and 1996 as head of the Human Rights Watch Office. And I've visited periodically since and done research on, on how the country has rebuilt. There are a few things that um, I, I note about that. I, I'm, I could talk a lot about some of the lessons uh, that frightened me um, based upon Rwanda, about the degree to which it just takes a small group of activists to divide a country and to bring violence. But, but tonight we're looking at the other end um, and talking about sort of how, how we, we solve the problems. And um, I, I think um, what's interesting about Rwanda is that they've had a lot of extensive government programs 
Um, they've had a lot of top-down initiatives to try to have accountability. Uh, it's the, the Rwandan genocide is the event in human history that has been the most adjudicated. There have been more than a million uh, cases um, dealing with the Rwandan genocide um, in mostly local level courts. Um, there's been a lot of justice done. Frankly, uh, a lot of the trials have not been that great. So it's hard to say that they've really meted out justice, but there's a lot of attention been given. The government has also instituted a lot of programs to memorialize the genocide. Uh, they have revised school curricula. There have been extensive programs. Um, and yet when I've been in Rwanda, um, what I found is that those programs don't have the kind of impact that people think they might. Um, and it's largely because they're imposed from above. Where I see reconciliation happening is often at the grassroots level. Uh, there was a friend that I had who uh, I knew before the genocide um, who lost uh, all of her family. Um, she was not at home, she was at work uh, a couple of hours walk from, from her home um, when the genocide took place. She hid out there, was saved by people. Unfortunately, she, she was raped a number of times before she went into hiding. Um, but after the genocide, um, she went to look for her family and she found that uh, her parents had been killed, her grandparents had been killed, all of her brothers and sisters had been killed, all of her uncles and aunts had been killed, all of her first cousins had been killed. As a matter of fact, in her entire extended family, there were only two second cousins who had survived. Um, I met up with her again after the genocide and at one point she needed to go back to her home community uh, for, for uh, registration and so I drove her back and um, we went to the government offices she needed to go to, and then she said she wanted to go back and see her house. So I accompanied her back to her home. Um, it was just rubble. Um, the home had been torn down uh, and there were just rocks scattered around, uh, but it was a large area where it, no farming had taken place. Um, and she looked at this and said, you know, this, this was my home. This is where I grew up. Um, and while we were there, a, a woman came from nearby. Um, she came sort of running up the hill and uh, she said, oh, Anizi, Anizi, I'm so happy to see you. She said, uh, I, I have saved some things from your household. I've saved some roof tiles and some pots and pans. Can I give them to you? And honestly looked at her and said, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't need those. She said, I've got a new life in the capital and I, you, can, you can keep them. Um, and uh, then she looked around and she said, you know, and, and I'll never come back to farm these fields. So why don't you farm them? Um, because you can, you can uh, use them more than I can. Um, the woman walked away. And as, um, as Anasi and I were walking down the hill, she said, that woman's family killed my family. Um, and she looked around and she said, you know, this isn't my home anymore, I'm moving on. When I look at something like that, to me, uh, it shows the power of individuals at the grassroots level to find reconciliation themselves. Um, this is a, a person who had lost just about everything um, and yet when she encountered somebody who was directly related to those who had taken it from her, she was willing in her own way to forgive and to move on. For all the big government programs that we talk about, they're necessary, they play a role, but the most important reconciliation that comes about is often at the, at the, the local level, at the grassroots level, uh, among individuals coming back together and finding ways to reconcile themselves. Um, the, the, the second point I, I wanna draw um, is uh, a very different point, which is, is from the South African case. Um, in, in South Africa, where I, I've taught a few times and have spent a lot of time and done a lot of research, um, you've had a change where, you know, those who were at the bottom, the uh, uh, Black African populations and other uh, uh, populations who were non-white um, were able through struggle to come into power. Um, it's a country that is uh, democratic and respects human rights. Um, and most of the leadership of the country is now uh, from the group that was previously excluded and that suffered under apartheid. Um, and yet in the South African case, there's still a lot of frustration. Um, it's true that the president is now uh, black and most of the people in positions of power are black. Uh, when you go to um, the malls and other public spaces, they're very mixed now. There's a, a great deal of integration. Uh, there are neighborhoods that used to be white that are now very mixed. Um, and yet, uh, if you get out of areas of wealth, what you find is the population is not mixed. Um, poverty is still very much concentrated within, uh, within uh, a, a, a segment of the population that is overwhelmingly black. Um, and 
the South African case cautions me um, when I look at the United States, uh, because in South Africa, you have had a group that was on the outs that came into power um, that has uh, been able to uh, gain political power. Um, representation is important. Um, they've done a lot to revise school curricula and uh, racism is not acceptable in the society. It's the rainbow nation now. And yet the inequality that was created by the racist system that was in place has never been addressed. When I come back to the United States, I worry a lot because I, I for many years taught African-American politics uh, when I taught before I, I came to BU. Um, and one of the things that always came out with students thought, oh, we just need to educate people out of racism. And if we all get racism out of our hearts and we all get along, then that's gonna solve the problems. When I look at the South African case, I can say, look, you know, the, the black population is now in charge. And yet, because the legacies of racism, particularly the economic legacies haven't been dealt with, the inequalities are still there, the frustration is still there and racism has embedded itself in the society. When I look at American society, I think we've made a lot of advances in terms of changing how people think changing what is acceptable. We maybe have backstepped a little on that over the past few years. Uh, and yet I think the majority of the population really is against racism, uh, wants to uh, oppose these um, uh, prejudices against people. And yet we lack the willingness to deal with the deep inequalities that are rooted in a history of slavery and of Jim Crow and of redlining and of all the other structural issues that have divided our society along racial lines. So I actually think in the United States, we can look at other places to think about how they have moved forward and what they've confronted by thinking about some of the big structural changes that we need to make, particularly addressing inequality. Um, I, I think we can make some difference. And then also thinking about how things happen at the personal level and the ways in which we as individuals can reconcile and come to terms. So I'll stop there, thanks. Good evening. Long before I knew of Dr. Howard Thurman's philosophy of the search for common ground, I was living it. Thurman believed that the search is a twofold journey. He would say the first step is one of personal self experience, exploration, excuse me. When you can go down deep inside yourself, really know who you are and are secure in who you are, then you can find yourself in every other human being. The second step is one of building community. We often treat racism and ethnocentrism as something that is studied and mentioned only in academia, as opposed to something that we experience in various ways every day. We highlight the great things in notable figures' lives, but we never highlight the context and systems put in place to prevent them from succeeding. In preparing for this evening, I struggled for weeks about how this topic related to my life. As I continued to struggle with what I would say, I began to think about how Howard Thurman, born 45 years before me, had experienced racism during his life and how I had too. As a young boy raking leaves in a white person's yard, their young daughter taunted him by messing up the piles of leaves. When Thurman asked her to stop, she stuck him with a straight pin that she pulled out of her dress. When he cried out with pain, the girl said, that didn't hurt you, you can't feel. In my childhood in the mid 1950s, I spent three years in a tuberculosis sanatorium. Of the 50 or so girls there, I was one of only three black girls. And of all the children, I was the only one whose family visited every week and brought treats for everyone. My aunt to hairdresser also came every week to do my hair and brought pretty ribbons and barrettes, which I shared with other children. One nurse resented my generous, educated, well-dressed family who also had a car and she took her hostilities out on me. One night that nurse took me into our large bathroom and closed locker room. She made me stand still while she cut off all my hair and I quietly cried. Knowing I was afraid of the dark, she then locked me in my clothes closet and shut off the lights. My cries and pleas to let me out were ignored. I must have cried myself to sleep and someone moved me because I awoke in my bed the next morning. Like many young girls, I loved my long braids. Being in the hospital, bringing me books and prettying my hair was one of the only things my family could do to try to make me feel happy 
and help me believe I would get better. Hair, since the beginning of time, has been used as an instrument to denote beauty and strength or used as a means of humiliation and a sign of enslavement. Though I was humiliated by being made nearly bald, my loving grandmother Ruth soothed my hurt feelings just as Howard Thurman's grandmother Nancy had always eased his. At that young age, I didn't understand that I was a victim of racism and ethnocentrism. As I grew up and endured other racist experiences, I would come to recognize the resilience that my family had instilled in me. Their spirit, strength, and determination were deeply rooted in who they were, and they passed those things on to me. In 1974, I was one of only four Boston Globe Black reporters who covered the nation's then biggest story, the Supreme Court's public desegregation ruling, better known as the busing crisis in Boston. Black people still had lots of apprehension and reluctance about how this busing ruling would work. On the first day of school, when buses carrying black children to white schools were stoned, parents protested and refused to put their children back on buses. My reporter's assignment was to pose as a bus monitor and ride the bus with the children. That first day, I truly approached riding the bus with the mindset of a news reporter out to get her story. But as the bus was attacked, I quickly realized that neither my profession nor purpose for being on the bus would protect me from the harsh violence waged against the innocent children on the bus. To the angry crowd, I was just another black person on that bus. As stones and rocks were breaking windows and people were rocking the large yellow school bus trying to tip it over, the children shouted, get down Miss Kennedy, as they pulled me to the floor. That day was one of the most challenging and defining moments in my life. For a few moments, I experienced an inner struggle. Was I Katherine Kennedy, the Boston Globe reporter on assignment? Or was I Katherine Kennedy, just an irrelevant black person like the students on the bus, ducking from the stones, breaking the windows, hearing the hateful taunts of white adults screaming, niggas, go home. At that moment, I realized I had a responsibility beyond myself, both as a journalist and as a black person. I felt a strong commitment to all black children riding buses across America and to all black people fighting and dying for equal rights. I knew I had to write the most accurate, detailed, objective, and fair account of these children's experience. My dedication to advocating for social justice and equality will continue as UC Berkeley, sorry, my light just went out, at UC Berkeley, in the NFL, in political fundraising, and at Boston University. In all of these experiences, I have been forced to fight against racism and ethnocentrism. There is a level of fight and resilience that Black people have to acquire that people of other races and ethnicities do not. While I didn't know it at the time, those values were the foundation for my ability to persevere. When I feel discouraged, I think of my slave ancestors and my family members. What they endured was far worse. I remind myself how they never gave up and I owe it to them to keep pushing on. Whenever I feel oppressed, even like today, I say to myself, they will not make me fail. I also think of a line from Howard Thurman's meditation, I will not give up. He said, I will not give up. I will use to the full every resource in me and about me to answer life with life. Howard Thurman believed in the unity of all people. And one of his quotes has been the driving force in sustaining my hope in the unity of all people and our interconnectedness. He wrote, for this is why we were born. People, all people belong to each other. And he who shuts himself away diminishes himself and he who shuts another away from him destroys himself. Having the privilege to serve as the director of the Howard Thurman Center allows me to continue his mission of breaking barriers of divisiveness, eliminating racism and ethnocentrism. Thank you. Uh, it's it's I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm next up. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as a cultural historian, I'm going to it's gonna be a little bit less personal, I'm gonna be honest, and um, you'll see, you'll see. And I'm gonna share my screen, uh, so 
Uh, here we go. So today I, I want to talk a bit about the language of the tide, uh, and I find it appropriate, although not although not perfect, to talk about cultures of activism. Uh, they have highs and lows. They are always in process, rising and falling. Uh, uh, they can arrive with an undeniable force that alters the surrounding landscape. Uh, they can dissipate to the extent that its once might uh, seems to have almost have disappeared. And we scratch our heads and wonder where its majesty went. The tide has already come in. Uh, the 2020 mur murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis uh, catalyzed nationwide protests. In Portland, Oregon activists took to the streets, uh, not just once, but every day for 100 consecutive days. The murder of Breonna Taylor, uh, as well as the failure to indict uh, the officers who shot and killed her as she rested in bed, inspired countless men and women to take to the streets to express their outrage. Others found alternate ways to keep her name and memory alive. Here at BU, students and staff, faculty and alumni have gathered virtually, uh, even in the midst of a pandemic, to call attention to the importance of dismantling structures that enable racism, gender bias, and other forms of prejudice. There is a palpable sense of possibility in the aftermath of a presidential election, or perhaps we're still indeed in the midst of one, um, or uh, certainly as the books on anti-racism top bestseller lists, uh, and streets continue to team with people demanding change and declaring enough. History tells us that the tide will go out. Uh, in the wake of the 2012 murder of Tr Trayvon Martin in Sanford, Florida, hundreds of people assembled in Union Square for the Million Hoodie March, uh, one of scores of public gatherings across the nation. Congressional Representative Bobby Rush violated House rules uh, by donning a hooded sweatshirt in protest of the uh, racist profiling that led to the killing of Martin. Uh, the death of Martin uh, dominated the headlines. NBA superstars uh, uh, LeBron James, du uh, Dwayne Wade, among the other members of the Miami Heat basketball team, shared an image of themselves uh, labeled, we are Trayvon Martin. The tide was high and yet it receded. The gap between then and now, the in-between, are reminders that movements can slow down, its volume can lower. As the tide goes out, uh, movements continue, uh, but evidence of their effectiveness can sometimes be overlooked. In these moments, this is why local organizations matter. Regional organizing, grassroots organizing, structures that support dialogue and facilitate listening are so important. There is a cyclical nature to movements. Uh, nevertheless, this tends to be de-emphasized. Uh, President Barack Obama uh, frequently quotes Martin Luther King Jr.'s assertion that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice, which King borrowed and revised from Theodore Parker's more cautious, the arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience, and from what I can see, I'm sure it bends toward justice. The metaphor of the tide, its cyclical yet evolving nature allows us to account for the ascendancy of Barack Obama as a presidential candidate. Uh, a high water mark might be the moment of his second inauguration. It also accounts for a series of ever lowering lows, uh, the murder of Trayvon Martin, the persistence of hate speech, uh, recent efforts to erase the legacy of the first African-American president, the rise of, of a supremacist rhetoric. The tide accounts for both the steps forward and backward in a larger journey toward racial justice and radical inclusion. It allows us to see uh, in a wide-eyed and pragmatic way what challenges exist ahead of us. It reveals the obstacles that appear under the surface that threaten social movements. It renders apparent the bias, the racism and hate that need to be confronted, needs to be overcome, needs to be moved beyond. It helps us to see uh, how and where to enter into a movement as well as when to launch uh, when to launch, when to set sail, and when to advance forward. Uh, as the water rises uh, and uh, the high tide of activism calls to us, it beckons, it calls to us, it says, get in, get in now. Uh, do not allow the sinister depths what lies beneath to deny the realization of our possibilities. Now, a person might ask, why bother uh, if bias, if prejudice uh, might return? And the answer is that change can be affected. Societies can be shifted and transformed by efforts to dismantle structures that enable racism and discrimination. Opportunities for regeneration and growth exist. A, a few examples in conclusion, uh, Stacey Abrams, uh, who followed an unsuccessful election, but chose to stay, chose not to move away, to remain in Georgia, to build a coalition that would ensure that voices that had been marginalized and not counted would be counted this time around. 
or Elizabeth Alexander as head of the Mellon Foundation, who literally is giving us all a chance to write histories anew uh, while also preserving our heritage or innumerable artists like Dominique Morisot, who through playwriting has created an archive of rarely told cultural experiences. Or of course, the students who currently walk this campus at Boston University, who are informed and touched every day by the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, on East Campus, as well as the legacy of Howard Thurman on West Campus, and understand that substantive change can begin here at BU. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will find my remarks. So as you can see, each of us comes at this a slightly different way. Uh, one of my research and teaching interests has been the political psychology of prejudice and stereotype and conflict among, student, uh, among social groups, for example, on the basis of race and gender. For my comments, I'm going to leave aside dyed in the wool racists and ethnocentrists. What I want to focus on are the rest of us who think of ourselves as caring deeply about justice, equality, fairness, and even anti-racism. And for the moment, I'm going to focus on white people and the problem of regenerating from racism and ethnocentrism. And in particular, what psychological research can tell us about how people who want to live up to the standards we claim for ourselves can do better. The world is not neatly divided into racists and non-racists, ethnocentrists and non-ethnocentrists, anti-Semites and non-anti-Semites. The reason is that we grow up and live in a society that imbues us with an understanding of cultural stereotypes and associations about different groups of people. We learn what those cultural connections are. We hear them repeatedly. If I asked everybody watching online right now to name common stereotypes about people of different races, ethnic backgrounds, or religions that are familiar in this particular society, you could rec recite them to me. They are part of your cultural vocabulary, even if you don't believe them. But as long as they are part of the cultural vocabulary in our society, we may not assume that we're fully immune. As psychological research has shown, we recognize and understand these connections. And as such, we may even use some of these associations without noticing it. These underlying assumptions and attitudes can shape our perceptions and our behavior. An example of how perceptions are shaped non-consciously, albeit in an extreme case. When the first police on the scene reported back to their colleagues what they saw when they saw Tamir Rice holding a toy gun. They described him as a black man, perhaps about 20 years old. In other words, an adult. But Tamir Rice wasn't 20, he was 12. How could one possibly see a 20 year old in a 12 year old boy? Who would mistake? a 20-year-old, a 12-year-old for a 20-year-old. Well, research shows that lots of white people have a tendency to see black males larger than they are and to see young black males as older than they are. In other words, our eyes might see a person who is more threatening than he is and we don't even realize it. This could happen to those of us who would hate the prospect of doing such a thing. Certain situations, though, can activate those assumptions and attitudes. That is, they can bring them to the fore in our perceptions and behavior. What are those situations? Well, when we're stressed, when we feel threatened, when we are acting without thinking, when we have such confidence that we're good people who would never be prejudiced, that we are not reflective about how we treat other people. There's experimental psychological research that shows in each of these cases, these stereotypes and prejudices can come to the fore. So what does this mean for the problem of regeneration? How do people who want to be anti-racist, who want not to be ethnocentric, fulfill our ethical ambitions for ourselves? I think the political psychology research suggests a few things. One, obviously, is remaining as thoughtful and self-reflective as possible. But others including, include not being 
quite so sure that our own behavior is as unassailable as we would hope. Owning the possibility that our words, our behavior can indeed reflect those cultural connections that shape racist or ethnocentric behavior. And by owning it, maybe instead of stressing about it, which is only likely to make things worse, maybe we can focus on figuring out how to be the people we want to be and not reject accusations out of hand by saying, well, I'm a good person. Let me end with a personal example. One of my good friends in college was from a working class Catholic family. And one day she was talking about a purchase she made where the price was arranged through bargaining. And she said to me, I was really able to Jew her down. And she stopped and her eyes went wide and she looked stunned and upset. Oh my God, she said, I never realized what that meant. But she certainly understood it when she said it to me, a Jew and her friend. She learned something, that's good. So I hope that all of you out there have, have plenty to chew on here. And the man behind the balloons is going to probably come out from behind the balloons and <laughs> Pedro Falci, um, and will feed us some questions from you. Thank you, Gina. Everyone watching, please submit your questions using the Q&A functionality and I'll read those to the panelists. So here is number one. What should we say and do with racists who have no moral conscience, no ability to regenerate? Anyone? I feel as though everyone has the ability to be uh, redeemed. Um, and, and I think that oftentimes what happens, and this is where I think colleges are so important, right? Because it's like people come in um, from all over the place. And, and, and if you think about the average college student, um, your, your experience set is often quite local and it's limited to wherever you're from, you know, uh, you know, what your, your family, what, your, you know, what, what the conversations are around you. And, it's, and, and, and for many people, it's the first time that they're actually on campus or they're actually encountering people from different backgrounds, different religions, different um, ethnicities, different gender identities, um, that I think that there's the awkwardness and there's the, 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 the damage of, of, of misaligned conversation. Uh, but I do think there's the opportunity for growth. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not a person who believes that a person cannot be redeemed. I do think that um, you know, we can often ask ourselves, you know, why does it fall upon us to be the person always trying to be forgiving of someone else's intolerance? Uh, and that is its other, that's a whole other level of, of how do you sort of uh, maintain the energy to keep moving forward, you know, when there's so much negativity out there. Other responses from the panel? I would agree with Harvey um, in terms of the being, feeling redemption for someone, because when you, if you allow whatever they've said or done to fester within you, it takes you down and it makes it um, that much harder for you to be able to um, move forward. And I think that we have to continue to try to help people see um, the difficulty in what they're saying and how hurtful and harmful it can be. Um, you know, Oftentimes, we're not fortunate um, to have an experience like you did with your friend who immediately realized once she said something out loud. And so I think that it behooves us all to at least try to make an attempt to have a conversation with someone. If that doesn't prove um, fruitful, <clears throat> then I think you do have to move on, but not let it have um, a defeating um, effect on you. Yeah. I think um, one of the things that can be helpful is to understand why people end up um, being the kind of extremists that you that you mentioned. Um, in in Rwanda, some of the people that I knew who were the most um, virulently anti-Tutsi were people who were of mixed race, 
um, people who had Tutsi blood because they needed to protect themselves. Um, and by hating um, their the people who were Tutsi, it, it allowed them to sort of protect themselves from attack. Um, you look at, you know, who have been some of the most dangerous homophobes in American history, you know, Roy Cohn and, and uh, Joseph McCarthy, um, you know, J. Edgar Hoover, people, you know, people who in their private lives were in very, you know, we would judge them as gay, and yet they were the ones attacking gay people and accusing them. Well, why? Because it was a way of protecting themselves and they could distance themselves from it. And so I think one of the things that can be helpful is you may not be able to redeem people like that, but I think it can help us to realize that people who are expressing such extreme prejudice, it, it, it's probably coming from somewhere. Um, and they're, you know, they're compensating, they are hiding their things. And for me, that sort of gives me strength because I, I can say, okay, well, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't justify their actions. Um, but it also suggests that there's, there's something more there. Uh, maybe that is a crack that you can use to, to get at some of those people to change them. I think I would think about it at, at two different levels. One is on the individual level, what can we do about that person? Um, and here, here again, I think I would like to, to focus this on, say, what happens when, when a white person encounters a white racist ethnocentric, you know, what happens, what happens when you encounter somebody who is, who is expressing, you know, anybody, anti-Muslim feelings or anti-Semitism or homophobia or whatever. On the individual level, I think there are a lot of us who have reached the conclusion that, that bystander behavior to harm um, cannot include just silence. But what does it include? And I, and I think that really depends on our own skills at communication, our own capabilities at dealing with things like, like anger um, and our skills at intervening. A and there are a lot of people who are in the business of teaching and learning about how to do bystander um, um, intervention and, and what kinds of things you, you can do. Because obviously there's the question of what can you do about the perpetrator, but also what can you do about the victim and not just sort of leave them there and say, well, there's nothing I can do about it. The occupational hazard of probably all of us on the screen is we are educators. And, and you know, maybe our motivated reasoning is that most of us refuse to think that you're ever, there's ever a complete impossibility of learning. And the question is how to find the way through. But I wanna raise this to a different level, which is really where I started, that a lot of this individual behavior comes from things that are societal level and structural and cultural. And so, so part of what we can deal with is not necessarily that person standing right there, but what do we do even in our day-to-day -day lives, if not professionally, but what do we do in our day-to-day -day lives that builds cracks in those cultural understandings that makes it harder to be racist or ethnocentric that flies in the face of that, which is why some people talk about not just being um, non-racist, but being anti-racist. That is, you know, you don't just wait around for something bad to happen and then figure out what to do. What do you do in your day-to-day -day life that tries to create an ethical culture? And I think that all of us have a duty to do that from day to day life and in, in whatever we do in our private lives and also whatever we do in our in our professional lives. Are there groups or organizations in the United States that are effective in regeneration that we can join to amplify these efforts? Working on this sort of thing as an individual can be difficult. Suggestions, colleagues? There are, I think there's so many groups that work at things from different angles. Um, you have groups like the ACLU fighting and the NAACP fighting for, for rights. You have groups that are involved in um, trying to get uh, innocent people out of prison. Um, you have uh, organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty that work for rights international, internationally. 
Um, I can say from my own personal experience, having um, lost a number of friends in the genocide in Rwanda um, and then going back and studying what happened, um, what really helped for me from, from my own personal mental health was to work for a human rights organization um, and to be able to report on what happened and to make suggestions on how things could be better and to expose injustices that were there. And so um, I think there are lots of things that you can do as an individual that just, you know, whatever piece that you're putting in to make a difference, um, I think can make you feel less powerless um, because if you're just sitting on your own, there's not much you can do, but when you join a group, there's a lot of other people who are working for things. And there's a lot of different groups doing a lot of different things. And those efforts multiply one on the other and I think can change the world. All sorts of other ones, um, except for those churches that seem dedicated to ethnocentrism, uh, so many religious organizations have a piece of them that is devoted to social justice and to action. Arts organizations, if you, if you look around, you know, any, any city or town that is rich with arts, you're almost bound to find some that are dedicated um, to changing that cultural narrative I was talking about that, that demonstrates other ways of thinking. So I think in, in sort of every aspect of life and walk of life, there are possibilities to use our interests and our skills and our passions to do this kind of work. I think the one thing we can't do is become overwhelmed by how much work there is to do because no one of us and certainly no group can, uh, can deal with all of it at the same time, but we each take a piece of it and work in our domain of life. Catherine, did you want to add anything? No, I think I, I was going to refer to the religious groups as well, that almost all of them is have some sort of a reconciliation um, ministry that, that um, anyone can be a part of, even if you're not a member of that particular religion or church or synagogue or mosque. There are also a lot of groups that are in, involved in um, how to engage in helping people understand how to engage in difficult conversations, which is often a code word for talking about race um, or talking about sexuality or talking about religion. And, you know, it takes experience. Um, it takes finding a vocabulary and it takes finding a comfort so that it's not scary. And I think that there are a lot of places, if, if you're interested, I bet if you headed over to the Thurman Center in Zoom, place, you would find some some nice avenues. And if I could just add a, a couple of things, uh, and this is truly from an arts perspective, uh, there are a lot of arts organizations. Uh, so within theater, there's a lot of theater for social change organizations, which, you know, the whole point of the of, of the, the conversations they host, uh, the performances they put on, the, the, the sort of networks they're trying to create uh, relate to uh, sort of thoughtful considerations of what can be done in the real world, right? So it's not escapist. It's actually like difficult dialogue relating to um, you know, sort of issues in the ground, right? And and every, I'm not going to say every major city has one, but 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 uh, every major every state has one, <laughs> you know. So I'd say like Sojourn Theater, which is actually now in Arizona, is one of my favorite companies on this line. But if you just Google theater for social change. That's an option. Uh, and what's wonderful about it is that. Uh, there is a real commitment right now to continue to create work uh, virtually. So no matter where it is in the world, uh, and certainly within the U.S., uh, you can access it and be part of those conversations in, the, in those communities. I'd also say that a lot of these organizations have have social media presence. You know, so like there's like Facebook groups or there's um, Instagram groups and stuff like that. So there's so there's a way to uh, become part of that network. Um, and I would say that if you look at programming, for example, so at Booth Theater, uh, which is here at, at BU, uh, just this before COVID, <laughs> you know, we, uh, we hosted, uh, we did the Exonerated, uh, which is about uh, wrongful convictions and conversation with the New England Innocence Project. Uh, so there's lots of opportunities uh, to use the arts, you know, to, to learn about social organizations that then you can sort of volunteer and be part, be, be part of the list and stuff like that. So I would say uh, just uh, while we're virtually apart, uh, make use of of, of these digital platforms that will allow you to experience different communities in the same way some people are like shopping for churches you know that which they can do much more easily virtually um, you can actually shop for 
um, uh, th these organizations within the arts uh, or other organizations and be a member of them. I would plug Company One in Boston as a good example. For this is a longer question, so I'll also share it with the panelists in the chat function, but I'll read it as well. When there is no accountability for heinous acts, there's no closure and no start for healing. The election does verify for me that about one third of adults in the US are okay with hate, threats, white privilege, and the premise of might is right. How do I relax or try to heal when I feel I am confronted with wave after wave of hateful acts? If I am being beaten and the lashes continue, I can become numb to it. But if I try to heal, I just feel the lashes all over again. Am I to believe feeling the beatings repeatedly in 2020 is better than feeling numb? Mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, that's 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 real. Um, uh, and I, I had the experience of I visited the. Uh, intro class uh, for theater uh, right after the election. I think it was the day or two of the election. Um, and, you know, there, there, there wasn't much air in the room, right? I mean, you know, in terms of just, uh, you know, just people were still trying to make sense as we all were. And in some cases we still are, right? Uh, you know, sort of making sense of uh, the presidential election also uh, the, the, the transition. Uh, the, the reason why I've been using the language of, of tides, right? These tidal movements. And, and, and this, I keep thinking about that second inauguration for Obama, right? You know, that on that day, um, you know, I certainly personally could not conceive of this moment we are in, right? Like, you know, on, on day one of, of, of Barack Obama's like second term, you know, I imagine sort of the trajectory we were on as a country and the conversations we're gonna have and the opportunities around inclusion were gonna be a lot different um, um, at this point in time, you know, you know uh, than they currently are. Uh, so, 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 so I think that for those people who are just like, you're feeling beaten, you're feeling down, you're feeling, you know, uh, 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 run over, um, you know, you, you have to hold on to that memory, right? You have to hold on to that in the same way that Rosa Parks, you know, sort of held on to the memory of, 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 this, you know, of, of remembering just recently then this, you know, Emmett Till's experience, right? To, you know, to, to act out, right? Um, and I think, you know, and that when these moments, you know, where you can make change uh, occur, you, you, you go full on out, right? Because there, there's a point where it's like the progress tends to kind of go back a bit and then go forward again, the back a bit. Um, and, and I think that's what you have to do. You have to like, you know, uh, remember the, the pain um, so you can actually, you know, you know, make it not impact other people in the future. The, the question started with a question about accountability. And I think one of the things that can be helpful is to think about accountability more broadly than just trials. Um, we focus a lot on putting people in prison, right? And so there's, you know, this talk about, well, after putting children in cages, uh, Kirsten Nielsen, the head of DHS should be put in prison or, or you know, uh, that's probably not gonna happen, to be honest. Um, we're, we're probably not gonna have very much judi judicial accountability for anything that's happened over the past, past four years. Um, but there are other ways in which you can have accountability. Um, you know, there are ways of remembering and recognizing and sharing the pain of uh, people's experiences that, that can be really meaningful. If you think about something like the, the new uh, African-American History Museum in Washington, that, that's a form of accountability, right? Because it's accounting for what happened in the past. It's, it's raising up the experiences of a lot of people and raising up their, both their suffering and their uh, sufferings and their joy. Um, if we think about memorialization and the arts and uh, museums, and there, there's a lot of different ways um, in which we can confront the past um, and, and hold people accountable for what has happened by recognizing the experiences that people have gone through, by pointing fingers at those who have caused harm. Um, and it doesn't have to just be through some form of judicial accountability. I, I think actually expressing our our frustration and our anger is one of the ways of holding people accountable. So, you know, when, when somebody is lashing you, it's speaking up and saying, I don't like that and I want it to stop. Um, it may not succeed, but it also might be empowering. A lot of this, this conversation, I think it's a, it's a great question. And, and I'd go in one place early, which is, I doubt any of us would talk about the healing involving relaxing. 
because healing takes a lot of work and especially healing in the face of injustice and of pain and of beatings takes takes tremendous um, energy and control and discipline and focus. And that's one of the reasons it's so exhausting for people who say, do I still have to deal with this? It puts me in mind of a really, um, a really interesting book. Again, I'll play political psychologist of a, a fellow political psychologist who wrote a book um, in the last couple of years on um, the politics of black anger. And, and I recommend it, a guy named Davin Phoenix, Phoenix spelt like the city. Um, and he, he did some research, a lot of surveys over time, where he began with what he thought was a really surprising result, which is in these surveys, when people were asked, you know, about their feelings about politics and what was going on, that African Americans were less likely to say they were angry by the situations around them than whites were. And these are, you know, confidential surveys and so forth. It's not sort of a lot of face-to-face -face interviews, but it was very consistent and he found this in different ones. And, and what he ended up doing was talking about the kind of control and, and discipline that people in oppressed groups, in this case, African-Americans learn that they have to discipline themselves to when they're around the more powerful people in order not to get hurt all the time. And his argument in the end was that um, in a sense, African-Americans, especially around whites, are, are not allowed to express anger. And even that anger itself can be suppressed in the same way, obviously I can't experience that directly, but I sure do know what it was like when I was younger when, it, when street taunting women was perfectly, perfectly fine. And I knew very well that if I walked past a group of men and they started street taunting me when I was a young woman, I had to walk past with my head straight ahead, neither up nor down and say nothing. And to not show any anger in my body at all or tension in my face, because if I did, what they would come back at me with was it would be even worse and was even more violent. And we all experienced that. And so I'm coming around to, to an idea that it is perhaps true that part of healing is the ability to express that anger. And that's what I think I see, for example, this year through Black Lives Matter and other things where people can get together and express that anger and say that anger to the more powerful people, but with enough other people around that, you know, that those words and those feelings have to exist. And, and that's just another way of saying that, no, it's not relaxation. It may be in fact, taking ownership of the anger and using it productively and constructively and well-pointed. And I'll just add, that I think that part of, of the importance of the articulation of that anger, that rage, right, um, you know, is, is one in which there's a, there's a demand that it's not just people of color, right, who experience that anger, that rage, right, you know, so like, like one should not have to have brown skin to be outraged that Michael Brown's body was like left out for hours, right, should be outraged that Tamir Rice, a kid on the playground was shot, right, one shouldn't have to be outraged that I mean, like everyone should be outraged rather that, um, um, you know, a person lying in bed would get shot in their own home, right? Or, or in someone's in their friend's home. You know, and I think that that's kind of part of the, uh, the resonance of the Portland, right? Um, uh, protest as well, right? Where it's, it's an articulation of the anger and that rage, but it's also sort of a demand that um, uh, more people recognize, you know, just the, 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 the frequency with which this violence, the hate, uh, the systemic, discrimination that people are facing, uh, particularly people of color are facing, uh, needs to be reconciled and I mean, it, needs, it needs to be addressed and needs to be um, uh, dismantled. Right? So I'm gonna read you two different questions, but they're asking for your advice as educators to students. The first question reads, 
what advice would you offer to students who believe that we've done enough talking and teaching? The second question reads, what have you learned from the younger generations? How do they inspire you to continue to push towards regeneration and how do you support them even if you disagree with their methodology? So one student says, we've done enough teaching and talking, what else can we do? And the other says, how do you, the educator, support the younger generation and uplift them even if you disagree with their methods? I'll, I'll, I'll attempt the second answer um, from my own experience. While I may not always agree, I always find that I learn something from the younger generation. And it gives me pause to stop and think um, about whether or not am I holding on to beliefs or attitudes because that's what I know, or am I really open to accepting some new education or um, information from them? And I think my way of dealing with it is to decide that both things need to happen. I need to hear them, respect them, accept them, and learn from them and let them know that they are teaching me but on the other hand, I feel it's my responsibility to also give them some education, some history back so that hopefully we can balance out how we both are thinking and feeling and come to a way of using both of our experiences or ideas as for a solution. I think on the first question of, you know, have we, how do we respond to people who say we've done enough, we've talked enough? The answer is no. <laughs> Sorry, no. Uh, you know, all you have to do is look at any data on inequality, economic, um, you know, cultural, all sorts of things. Look at education, look at anything, and you can still see the legacies of racism and that it's not enough. You still see people dying. You, you, you know, so much of what we've seen this year of, um, of people killed in bed, as Dean Young said, uh, you know, we have to keep teaching and we have to keep writing. With respect to, to uh, younger generations, I've been thinking about that a lot today, as a couple of people here know, um, because I taught my very first classes in 1974, and today I taught my last one since I'm retiring later this year. Um, what that means is I've been teaching uh, many decades of the younger generation and each new younger generation. My first younger generation are people who are now in their mid sixties. My last younger generation are people who are now 20, 21, 22. And what I found, you know, every year, every, every flow of that tide and that river that Dean Young was talking about is that while I haven't seen change in the fundamentals of the legacy of slavery or the legacy of our racisms or the legacy of the preference for certain religions or certain sexualities, that hasn't changed really underneath, but its expression has. People's experience of it has changed. The language people have, have used uh, has changed. And so every, every year for, for me, 46 years of dealing with a different younger generation, that conversation we have together and the way I learn and the way I understand what I understand is different because I'm hearing a different language and I'm hearing a different expression and I'm hearing a different music and I'm seeing a different art. Um, and, and that addition to the human experience over time is important just as, as Tim Longman started with that experience of understanding comparison across cultures and countries is important. I'll miss it.
Dr. Longman, this one's for you. What went wrong in the case of South Africa? How do we in the US avoid a situation similar to that in South Africa that appears to politically favor minorities but does little for economic equity? Yeah, it's, uh, as a political scientist, it's maybe dangerous to say, but I, I think the problem in South Africa is there was too much focus on politics. Um, and, and I do think we risk that in the United States as well. Um, you know, uh, we, we focus in, in the United States in particular on the presidency, you know, and winning the presidency and it kind of becomes everything. And um, when we think about systemic change, it, it's not gonna come from that level. Ultimately, I, I think it, it's only going to come when the grassroots demands it. Um, I, I'm working on a book right now, looking at, at uh, religion and politics across Africa, um, and one of the things I've, I've really been sort of struggling to try to understand why um, churches sometimes become activist. Um, why is it they, that that uh, they sometimes will stand up for human rights and demand democracy and things of that sort? And, and one of the clear factors is if their people demand it. <laughs> Um, that the bishops um, will care a lot more if the people in their congregations, if, if the, the local priests are coming to them and saying, these are issues we have to uh, encounter. And so for, for my, for, from my perspective, when, when we look at um, what needs to happen in the United States so we can avoid the sort of trap that South Africa has gone down. And, and I would say they've done a lot right in South Africa. There's a lot of good things. Uh, when I go to South Africa, I, I, I see very some very positive developments, but the inequality is problematic. Uh, when I look at the lessons from there for the United States, um, I actually think we're doing something right right, right now. I, I think if you look at the Black Lives Matter protests, they have focused on police brutality, um, but there's also been a broader critique of inequality and the lack of opportunities for uh, African-Americans. And there's been a push uh, for uh, things like a, a living wage. And there's a lot of other issues that are being um, promoted really from the grassroots, from the bottom. And, and I think it's only going to be if the population demands fundamental changes that aren't just about who's in office um, that will get those changes. Wonderful. Thank you. Next one. What do you think are the effects of casual racist, homophobic, or sexist comments? Do they reinforce negative stereotypes more than we realize? And in what way should we act when we hear these kinds of comments? So that's in my political psychology bailiwick. They reflect, uh, those comments reflect those attitudes and beliefs that th that language doesn't, doesn't exist apart from how we think. Um, it doesn't exist apart from the assumptions we have. So it flows from those assumptions. Uh, and yes, it has harmful effects. And again, there's a lot of psychological research on what difference it makes when people voice you know, racist comments or homophobic comments or, or sexist comments on other people because it's degrading and it's belittling. Um, at the very, very least, and I mean the very least, what it does is recall attention to just that aspect of the person who's receiving those comments. So, you know, it, let's talk about classrooms. When you have some professor who makes a sexist comment, it means suddenly for all the women in the room, if it's a sexist comment uh, against women, all of them, their attention suddenly focuses on the idea that they've been called out as women. And it, it dominates your attention. It means you can't pay attention to anything else. And all the research shows the dynamics of racist comments or homophobic content comments would be the same. It's you realize you're being reduced and where you're supposed to be working or learning or listening or talking suddenly you've been reduced by that other person. So it has a huge effect. And that's exactly where earlier I was talking about bystander behavior. It, it, it is just not right to let it pass. Um, you know, again, what I know best personally is standing around in a group and somebody makes some sexist comment and everybody sort of smiles stupidly and giggles. That is participating in the perpetrating. 
And it's the same with racist comments. It's the same, same with homophobic comments. You might as well be saying it yourself. If I can hop in here as well, I think that, so certainly in, indeed the, the, the responsibility is to, um, um, as we heard earlier today, not be silent, right? And, and, and to actually sort of speak back and, and to uh, tell people about how inappropriate uh, and damaging their words are. But the thing I want to add is that, you know, in my experience more often than someone saying something that is sort of explicitly racist or sexist like as a comment, you know, it's that within a conversation, um, you know, and this usually relates to, um, um, you know, sort of, does a person join a club? Does a person get hired? Does a person do whatever, right? You know, um, where there's some sort of gatekeeping function and then there becomes a sort of a series of coded uh, language uh, that becomes ultimate discriminatory, right? You know, so an example might be, um, um, you know, if you're hiring, for example, and, and you have a series of applicants and someone um, is dismissive and says, all, all of applicants should come from certain schools and, and those schools, to, you know, don't include public universities, they don't include historically black colleges, right? That itself is a form of discrimination, right? You know, and, and I think that, um, you know, people need to be mindful and look out for that. So it's not just the person who, who sort of tells the joke, the racist or sexist joke, it's also the person who mm -hmm. uh, uses some sort of coded language to prevent uh, true inclusion from occurring. Earlier, Ms. Kennedy talked about hair. That's a very good example. And there are actually a lot of people who have become very active with respect to expectations about hair and what's considered a, um, a professional hairstyle for a woman. Are braids professional? Um, it's big hair, professional. Uh, and so there really are people who are politically active in that way. I know some people who have been studying that kind of activism because it's coded. It's a coded way of saying, you know, certain kind of hair is professional and other hair is not professional. And it's of course based on expectations from the kind of people who have occupied the positions before and not the people who haven't occupied the positions before. Ms. Kennedy. As a native Bostonian and former Boston Globe reporter, how do you think the city of Boston is regenerating and shedding the legacies of the busing crisis? I think that Boston is trying, but I really feel like there has been um, a relapse in what the original intention was. You know, there was always a misunderstanding about what busing was supposed to be and what it was supposed to do. Busing was not about black people wanting their children to go to school with white children. Busing was about equality and black parents knowing that if their children went to schools with white children that had more resources then their children would get exposed to those resources too. An example that was given was that in a predominantly black school in a biology class, there were two microscopes that some 30 children had to share. But in the white school, there was at least one microscope for every two children, if not every child. So that was really the purpose of black parents um, wanting desegregation, but it was always viewed and used as a negative against um, Black people because the fear of some Black boy being around a white girl was always thrown up as some danger sign. I think that while Bo the intention was, was noble, um, and I don't have children, so it's hard for me to really be fair in totally judging. But from what I can see, our schools are back to being not to being segregated again. And some of them have probably even less resources, even though people are trying. And so what has happened is that we've now put a lot of emphasis on ex more on exam schools as being the place for your children to go and charter schools, which people you know, have mixed feelings about. 
So I don't think that from the mid 1970s, when I was covering the story as a reporter, that if I were to go back and research and see what is the difference today in 2020, I don't think that I would see a lot of improvement. And one of the ways I personally judge that since I don't have children in the schools is when I look at the students who apply to Boston University and where they're coming from. And when you look at young people from Boston, if they're going to one of our public schools, it is one of our exam schools generally, or a school that's been involved in the METCO program, which was really busing children to suburban communities, again, to have better access, but they're really residents of Boston. So when we bring them into BU, we're saying we have Boston kids, but not all of them went to Boston public schools. We certainly do have some, we do have many students that come from the exam schools, but we, there are many high schools that are Boston public schools that don't meet our standard of acceptance. So that's how I judge the success. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Dean Young, this one's for you. How important is racial, ethnic, and gender representation in film, television, and theater to this theme of regeneration? Oh, it's, 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 it's massively important. Uh, I mean, it's important for people to see themselves on screen, on stage, to understand that. And not only to have your stories uh, told and your experiences reflected, which themselves are validating, right? There's something really powerful to be like, I see myself, I see my story, I see my you know, you know, the stories of those people who preceded me, um, um, and whose, whose, whose achievements, whose struggles, you know, like make my reality. I think that's super important. You know, but also if you take, if you take um, Wheelock Family Theater, which is here in Boston, it's a professional theater uh, company uh, that's part of Boston University. Like they've had a commitment from day one uh, toward a diversity and inclusion uh, and non-traditional casting, right? So you would see um, Beauty and the Beast, uh, the musical, or The Little Mermaid, the musical. Like a lot of, there, there's musicals. There's also straight. There's also plays as well. Uh, and and in which you're looking at a person of color. Um, you know, there was a uh, Filipina American actress. You know, who uh, was in the was in the lead of Beauty and the Beast. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon to see. You know, the prince, the Latinx, the African American, the biracial. Be you know, it's like you know to represent. Their cast represents. Um, uh, the country, and 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 that's powerful for a kid to walk in, and or an adult to walk in and see that you know you can be the princess, the king, the banker, the lawyer, the whatever, and 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 that's why it's necessary to you know to be inclusive, uh, uh, and when it comes to retelling certain stories, non traditional. We have one more question from. Our friend Herb Jones, who Ms. Kennedy and I know as the great director of the Inner Strength Gospel Choir at BU. Hello, Herb. Thank you for your question. Don't we all have a responsibility to hold accountable verbally, politically, and economically the system and its players, which continue to permit heinous actions and policies? I think if I can speak, one, one thing that I, I think is hard right now is that there were a lot of us who were hoping that the election a couple of weeks ago would be a real repudiation of the troubling xenophobia, um, anti-Black, anti-Muslim, um, anti, uh, just about everything um, behavior that we've seen um, gain a, a support within our government over the past four years. Um, and so I think right now what we're doing is sort of struggling and saying, well, okay, somebody who's different won the presidency, but we didn't, it wasn't nearly as clear cut a victory as we wanted and it didn't resonate. So I, I do think it's a tough question right now is, you know, how, how do we demand accountability when it's clear that a large portion of our population um, doesn't want it? They, they're okay with what what's happened, um, you know, and I, I think all we can do is 
raise our voices, not as individuals, but um, as part of larger groups that we can organize, we can um, see how we spend our time um, and find other people who are like-minded and keep, keep struggling. It's exhausting, but, but I actually think the way that we uh, have accountability is, is really by, um, by demanding change, by um, getting better policies um, and um, you know, moving us in a, in a better direction as much as we can. And that's gonna take work because there's people fighting against that. I would say three things. One is don't think for a moment all this stuff that we're seeing is new. As a political psychologist, that's part of why I study when these kinds of attitudes and perceptions and understandings are activated. And one of the most important things is with leadership. And we've seen that tremendously now that we had leadership who gave it permission, not just giving it permission, but we had leadership that stoked it. But the racism, the xenophobia, uh, that wasn't invented, you know, in the last decade. It's all playing on what we had. It's still the legacies of slavery. It's still the legacies of, of inequality. So that's the first thing. It's been around a long time. And what we have to ask is, when can we look back and see that we have been able to regenerate and push that back and when doesn't that work? So that's the first thing. The second thing is we can talk about the system but political scientist here says, yeah, fine, let's, let's attack the system but which part, which levers? Um, the system can just feel so big and that's one of the reasons why I do what I do because what I do is I'm interested as a political scientist in isolating particular issues and problems and finding out where those levers really are and dealing with those particular mechanisms because dealing with the whole system, yeah, we have to deal with that, but you have to figure out what to unplug and what to smash and what to create and what to replace. And then the third thing is something else I was trying to raise before, which is this, the system is enacted by people um, and everything we've said about not being a bystander, everything we've said about having to act and be not just not bad, but actually be, for example, anti-racist is what's important um, because we have to deal with all of us on an individual level. So there's just a whole lot going on. I, I agree totally with uh, Dean Zapiro, but I guess I also want to say personally, so as to not feel hopeless or that it's a task so grand, I've chosen to make myself accountable through my work. And I think that's what we all on this panel do. I think that we all see all of those issues that we see in society are right in our own communities, whether it's our work community or where we live. Um, so that I think that wherever we can work to see change or to help others um, think, act differently, um, that's, that helps to make the change. And it may not seem effective to some and it may not have a big groundswell but every little i believe every little bit helps and that we all have to do our part and then hopefully if we can you know affect enough people um then some of those people are going to be able to either be those leaders those future leaders or will have an impact on some of the future leaders but i agree with gina this is nothing is new you know, when I talked about hair, you know, it's historic. It goes back to, you know, um, the 900s. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's not something that this nurse created to hurt me. It's something that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. So, um, yeah, we just, we just, we can't give up. I mean, that's the whole thing for me. You can't give up and you can't allow others to make you fail. And so even if you think your 
little piece isn't doing a lot, it is doing something as long as you are doing something. I think that's a great place uh, to end. We have just a couple of minutes. Um, somebody earlier asked what we all learn from younger people. And as you can see uh, on this panel, we've been at it a long time, some of us longer than others, um, but we've been at it a long time. And one of the things that's important in every generation and perhaps why we all here work at the kind of institution we do is that this work we've been talking about really requires at all times, the energy of the young, the frustration of the young, the short tempers of the young, um, the lack of feeling we've seen it all before. And some of that feeling that a lot of those of you who are young here will have that these old people have been doing it a long time. Why didn't they get it done? Um, and I think, it's really important to have that, that fuel of not just new perspectives, um, but the impatience of the young is every bit as important as some of that larger perspective and wisdom that some of us old folk hope we have. So I want to thank Ms. Kennedy, Dean Young, Professor Longman for bringing your brains and your hearts and your expertise to this wonderful, I learned from each of you. I'd like to thank Pedro Falci, who as always keeps us on the road, kept us organized and is a great um, uh, translator of, of questions. And I'd especially like to thank all of you who came out here tonight and are online, all 45 of you at the moment, um, up much more than that earlier. It's really great to see you, uh, your presence here. We will pick up the BU Student Faculty Forum again in the spring. Um, and in the early part of the spring, the two themes we'll start with is uh, uh, one of them will be on health and coming to health. I think we all wanna know about that and how that happens. Again, from an interdisciplinary point of view um, and also the environment and the earth. And so those, those two are uh, in process, and then we'll be thinking of at least one more. So I wish all of you um, light in this dark part of the year. I wish all of you health and safety and keep being smart. So thank all of you very much. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. Good night.